Hello and welcome to Dyslexia Explored. I'm Darius Nomderon, your host. And today I have someone who was told that they weren't college material. And they're in fact the Professor Emeritus, visiting scholar and artist in residence at the University of Pennsylvania involved with art, sculpture, design, and scientific research as well. I'd like to introduce to you Rebecca Kamen. Rebecca, it's great to have you here. Same here. Thanks for this exciting opportunity to share my story with you and your viewers. Well, I like to ask, I mean, you've spent 35 years in sculpture and design at a community college as a professor there and done so many other things. I've only scratch the surface of some of the things that you've done. And it's going to be fascinating to discuss your art practice and how it integrates with science and helps people understand the science of the mind as well. But could we just wind back to the early beginnings and tell us what was life like for you before you knew about dyslexia? Well, my story's to me, very unique in that that word dyslexia was not in the vocabulary when I was a child, and I wasn't aware of it until I became a college professor. I was very fortunate. I had wonderful parents who took us to very enriching experiences. We went to the ballet, we went to the theater, went to museums. And I was, I think the biggest gift I came into the world with was being very curious. And my parents were extremely generous in fueling that curiosity. I remember anything I wanted. I, I wanted a microscope, so I got a microscope. I got a chemistry set when I was in elementary school. We always knew chemistry magic was happening because it always smelled bad in the basement, which was my laboratorio. And then my personal favorite was my dad. I, I always wanted a telescope. So my dad found these instructions to build a telescope out of two paper towel tubes, and we purchased some optics from a place called Edmund Scientific Com in New Jersey. So we had to go to another state to buy the optics, and we built this incredible telescope, handheld, and I thought I could see the universe. Really, I could see the people across the street, but all these things really planted seeds of possibility as a child. And I think in a way I was sort of glad I didn't realize that I learned differently because I just propelled in my curious way, asking lots of questions. I was a student in class that always asked 10,000 questions. And I think the fact that I was that curious and I had a home environment that really celebrated that and supported that I think that really made me who I am today. And who are you today? What would you say you are now? <laughs> I'm only laughing because I'm one of these people who has way too many things on their plate, which is part of... Part of <laughs> dyslexia. Yeah, it's part of dyslexia. It's, it's like being at the smorgasbord table and can't deciding and just take it all. I've learned how to manage it somehow. It's like the plates on the stick, you know, how, how many plates can you have twirling? But what I have found on my own life journey is that richness of going up to the table of bounty and just taking anything that makes me curious and want to know more has really enabled me to create a life journey that not only enriches me, but in my capacity as an educator, in my capacity to be an artist, I'm able to share these discoveries with people all over the world, just like I'm doing right now. I've never um, been to Scotland, but now I'm here. <laughs> yeah, welcome to Scotland, even if it is virtually. <laughs> I'm so excited to really take this whole conversation from the perspective of an artist. And for those children who are budding artists and for those parents who have children who are budding artists and also 
curious scientists as well, because you bridge two interesting worlds. Could you tell us a little bit about your work so that it can help people frame the person they're listening to? What kind of work are you doing in art at the moment? Well, because of my curiosity <laughs> and because I cannot say no, I do a lot of public speaking. And let me just say, I became very interested in the intersections of art and science probably around 2008. So pretty early on before it really started taking off. Quite honestly, I wanted to be a scientist <laughs> because at a very early age, I was just curious how everything worked. And what happened was I couldn't get into college. You know, I was a B student, very curious. I couldn't take, in the United States, you have to take what's called SAT, the standard test. And my scores combined were what some people just get either in math or English. So unfortunately, I couldn't even get into a community college. And my parents always knew that I really wanted to teach because I don't know, I, I inherited the teacher gene. I, I love educating people. And so they went to the principal of my high school and they said to him, you know, our daughter really wants to go to school. Is there anything you can do? I mean, she appears to be bright and curious. So he wrote a letter and Penn State University, because I was living in Philadelphia at the time, said, all right, they would take me on probation only if I could make it. And basically what I found out years later, they told my parents, I don't know why you're wasting your money on your daughter, sending your daughter to college. She's not college material. So here I am on your podcast right now, showing that hopefully people will realize that all things are possible. You know, I always tell students, never ever be limited by what someone else tells you. And I was smart enough to know, and I think most dyslexic people are wired in a way that they see things differently. I knew I needed to find a major where I didn't have to take math. And there was one major that I could do and not take math, and that was art education. So it was great. I got to, I like to make things with my hands, and I like to educate. And Things just took off. Not only did they take off, I won a full fellowship to get a master's degree in art education from the University of Illinois, taught for several years and thought, you know, can I really get into the best art school in the United States? So I applied to Rhode Island School of Design. Not only did I get in, I got a full fellowship. So this is the young girl in the 12th grade that wasn't college material. So I'm saying this sarcastically only because I think you should never, that's the first lesson I learned, never, ever, ever be limited by what other people think. If you can feel it, if you want it, you can get it. And dyslexic people, from what I'm learning, are really wired to see possibilities that most non-dyslexic people don't get so to see. How long ago, if you don't mind me asking, how long ago did you discover you were dyslexic and what was the circumstances? Well, it was quite interesting. I was a college professor. I was always haunted by the fact that it was so challenging for me to get into college because once I was there and once I found the field that really made my heart sing and, and that I could really contribute, then everything just took off. But I was always haunted by why it was so challenging to me. Like Einstein says, every crisis is a potential opportunity. And, and I've always felt that way about my journey. And it's a light that I try to hold for others when I go out and talk and lecture to people. But what happened was I had a friend who was a special education professor at the University of Maryland. And we were met up with each other at, at the beach one summer. And I don't know, we just started talking about students and students that learn differently. And I shared that story that I just shared with you. And she said, you know, I think you might be dyslexic. And I thought, oh, I, I mean, I had heard of it. And then the more I started to research it, because I, I have to reveal this, I am a research junkie. <laughs> it started to really make sense to me. 
And in a way, it made me feel like, wow, you know, the more and more I read about it. And then when I would share it with others in lectures, I was finding people were coming up to me and asking me to be interviewed for things for students, you know, for their universities. And I thought, well, I'm, I want to take this on. I want to be an advocate of this. And I think as I started to move through my career, and you'll love this story. It's a great story. When I started my art science practice, I was awarded from my university a two-year professorship. And it was right before I was getting ready to retire. And I thought, but what I want to do on this professorship is I want to research the significance of art science. What is it about and how can I showcase it in my art practice? And it was such an incredible experience because I'd, I'd love to do public speaking. I mean, that's one of the things I've never been shy about. I, I love public speaking. And so what I was invited to do was to come and lecture in these scientific communities. Like the first one was the National Institutes of Health, which is our major health research institute out of Washington, D.C. And this is a really great story. And this is the journey that I find myself on is I did my usual dog and pony art science lecture and a young scientist came up to me and he said, wow, I was really moved by your presentation. If you have time, I'd like for you to come to my lab. I have some drawings that I'd like to share with you. And I said, oh, absolutely. And so anyway, so we went to his lab and he's an, it turns out he was a neuroscientist and I didn't even realize the group at NIH I was addressing. No one told me that. And it was a group of neuroscientists. And so Jeff and I were sitting at his desktop computer in his lab and he showed me a beautiful drawing of the retina of Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who is the father of modern neuroscience and actually won a Nobel Prize in 1906 for his discovery of neurons. And I felt like Alice in Wonderland. I saw that drawing on his desktop and all of a sudden, all I can describe it is like I was falling down this rabbit hole of possibility. And I could tell, he could tell how excited I was. So he kept showing me more Cajal drawings. And, oh, it was unbelievable. It was like this whole chapter had opened up. And I had been really struggling trying to finish a piece of sculpture for many months. And seeing these drawings, it was one of those aha moments. And literally I got home and two days later I, I finished the sculpture. And I was so moved by this experience and this being a catalyst that I took a photograph and I sent it over to Jeff. And at the same time I was lecturing there at NIH, I was also invited to lecture up at the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard which I couldn't believe. I mean, here again is this woman artist who couldn't barely get into college. And here I am presenting in the great observatory at the Center for Astrophysics to a packed group. And so when I got back, Jeff from National Institutes of Health said, can we have lunch? And I said, sure. So he said to me, how'd your trip to Harvard go, you know, how was your lecture? And I said, wow, they were really excited and want me to come back to do research there. So he says, all right, well, don't say anything to them yet. He said, I have a proposition for you too. He said, what are you doing this summer? <laughs> I don't even know this guy. Well, you know, I'm, I was just going to work in my studio. And he said, would you be willing to come up to NIH in the neuroscience department? I think I could arrange a fellowship for you. We've never done this before. I don't know if we have the money to do it again, but we do now. And would you do it? I said, absolutely. I'd love to. He said, and you'll do it over Harvard? I said, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll come to you first. But the, the beauty, and I did it, and it was a life-changing event. It was so life-changing because... Seeing those Santiago Ramon y Cajal drawings, and Cajal was a Spanish neuroscientist, I said to Jeff, 
what do you think? Do you think we could get some of those Cajal drawings in a display here at your new neuroscience research center? Because they were just building it at the time. He said, wow, that's a really great idea. <laughs> so everyone at NIH said, oh, no way. They're not going to do that. And they were national treasures. They had never left Spain. They had never left Madrid. The Cajal Institute invited Jeff and I to come and to do some research and to present a lecture. And not only did we present a great, two great lectures, but we negotiated to get drawings to come to National Institutes of Health and on a rotating basis. And it was really great because people at NIH said, oh, they're never going to let you do the library of medicine said, oh, they're never going to let you do it. And I believe that when you put a neuroscientist and an artist together, all things are truly possible. Fantastic. It, could you do us a favor who are listening? Could you sure. paint a verbal picture of these drawings that moved you so much? Could you help describe it to us? Oh, my God. Well, first of all, can I describe Cajal first? <laughs> Cajal came into the world wanting to be an artist. This is in the late 1800s. And basically, he had a very controlling father who was in medicine and said, no, you're not going to do that. But he was emphatic. He would draw every free moment that he could. And because I also have a master's degree in art education and an MFA in sculpture, when I went to the Cajal Institute, they were generous enough to let us look at these 7,000 drawings that he did. And the first ones they showed us were drawings he did when he was eight or nine years old. And as an art educator holding these drawings, his ability to see and record at such a young age, these beautiful landscapes, it just was breathtaking. And so when I lecture to neuroscientists now, what I've learned from my experience of looking at these beautiful drawings is that Cajal had this gift of being able to look through the microscope. And he was so intuitive because he was an artist. It enabled him to just draw in the most exquisite. And as someone who's taught drawing, just the line quality of being able to capture something that at that point in time, not many people who weren't neuroscientists got to see. And, um, and to be clear, we're talking here <laughs> about patterns because I, yeah, because I think it's for those who haven't seen your work and the influence he's had on you is, is this complexity of patterns that seem and look quite random, these random looking lines, but when you look at them, you know, they're not random, but they feel random, but it's an interesting sensation when you look at something and it looks random but you know it's not random. There's real meaning and pattern in there. Is that kind of what you saw in those first drawings? Because that's what I'm seeing in your work. Absolutely. And patterns are so critical for knowing in any field. Yes. You know, whether it's data, whether it's drawing, whether it's science. I mean, scientists and artists are always trying to describe the, the poetry of nature. And actually, I've been doing a lot of research on that at the moment, and my practice is trying to make science poetic for people. And just wanted to get back to one earlier thing that we were discussing. I came into the world wanting to be a scientist, and that was never going to happen. I could barely get into college. But I think that seed of that love for understanding the world around me and how everything works, the complexity of how everything works at the macro level, at the universe, the micro level, neurons, was so embedded in me. And being dyslexic, I think I was able to figure out something that made sense for me where I could do science, and this is the secret, on my own terms. And yeah. I do a lot of lecturing to scientists. Two weeks ago, I was doing a physics colloquium as an artist, if you can believe that, at American University to a room full of physicists. And that's what I said to them. 
you know, what I love about what I get to do is I don't have the rules you have, but I have that passion for observation that both an artist and a scientist have. Yeah. It's very Goethean in many ways, like Goethe, you know, have you done much work with Goethe or, or, or no, studied? No, but I'm familiar with Goethe. I mean, Goethe would really require people to observe artistically so deeply that it would end up moving into the realm of science. And he wanted that sort of not to be thought of as an either or, but was still in that sort of Renaissance phase where science and art was still very, very close and less separated. And it's that sort of Goethean observation that is kind of you're describing in many ways. I I really was struck by watching a piece of art that you had. This I saw this installation. And mm -hmm. for the listeners, big white room, some sculptures that looked like cones oh. that, that had all these intricate sort of neuron type patterns around it. And then it would turn slowly and underneath it were symbols that represented black holes, were they? Or what, what, what did you call it? Well, well Could I you describe that sort of thing so that people can get an understanding of the depth of what you're trying to do? Well, part of my fascination is to distill scientific phenomena down to mere mortals. <laughs> what I mean, mere mortals, people that aren't trained in a scientific tradition, because we are all impacted by scientific phenomena. You know, you don't have to be a scientist to experience, like I, I just came back from Iceland in January and I got to see the Aurora Borealis three times. Man, I felt like I won the trifecta. And what was so incredible about the experience, it was actually, I have to just share this story if it's okay. I, I was creating artwork for an exhibition, which just opened that showcases women scientists going back 300 years. And the, one of the earliest manuscripts, because I work a lot with scientific special collections and Cajal drawings definitely is in that category. But the first manuscript that was sent to me was from 1770. And it was sent to a woman named Laura Bassey. And Laura was a physicist. And it was sent to her from another physicist because he knew she would appreciate these observations he made because he got to see the Aurora Borealis. And this was in Bologna in Italy. And I was so moved by this translation that was sent to me of this document that I thought, I have to get on a plane. I have to go see this. I need to experience this. So what I've gleaned from my research and from my actual experience being surrounded by the Northern Lights or the Aurora Borealis was that in order for that magic to happen, that scientific phenomena magic to happen, the sun has to be really angry. It's got to be so disturbed that, and usually because of solar disturbances, it will eject these solar flares out. And in that process of ejection from the sun, very, very far away from us, it throws out these particles. So you have physics. So you have the physics of this experience of this solar flare and then the physics turns into chemistry because these particles interact with the atmosphere. And depending on what particles it is, that determines the color. So I love the fact, and I was just lecturing about this last night to a group of people at this museum, is that we're starting with science and through a scientific phenomena, physics intersects with chemistry, and those create an aesthetic experience. And so just having that experience made me understand why scientific phenomena is so exciting to me. And I feel like one of the gifts I've come into the world with is this ability to be able to translate this 
for audiences that aren't necessarily scientific. And the other thing that's very interesting that I've observed is the fact that science is so complex. There's so much information and even more now because of data that what happens is that people, even scientists, if it's outside of their realm of what they study, they're unfamiliar with it. And that's why when I'm invited to come into scientific communities, which I am quite a bit, they love it because I provide them with a new lens to think about what they're observing. And, and what you're talking about, this installation, I'm circling back now to that installation. If it's the one I'm thinking about, it's called Neurocantos or Songs of the Brain. And those conical shapes that are the way they're cut out, they represent neuronal patterns in, the, in our brains. And the circles on the bottom represent the universe at both micro and macro scales. And what's interesting, again, my own insights and discovery process is that you see similar patterns at, at both micro and macro, but an astrophysicist isn't going to research that. And a neuroscientist isn't going to research it because they're can be rather myopic. And that's what I love. What I get to do is I get to look at it all <laughs> and then make certain observations and then use my artwork as a way of distilling it to humanity. This podcast is sponsored by dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com, which helps you organize yourself creatively with a productivity system for Apple devices. I wonder if you could speak a little bit to young artists, you mm -hmm. know, who are maybe at art school themselves at the moment, like my daughter, who's at art school, and I can see it in her and I can see it in others that they're searching for their style or their purpose with the art you know I sometimes feel that there's a bit of a pressure on some artists to be kind of like activism within the artists that, that are like I've got to make a change or I've got to make a difference or I've make a, a protest or and one of the things that struck me and maybe I just want to talk this through a little bit both sure. as a parent and in the world of art as well, seeing it for my child and other children with dyslexia, so many people in the art world, 40% at least, have dyslexia. Oh, wow. Interesting. If you go to any art college and you screen them, you easily have 40% of them. 10% of the population have got dyslexia. 40% of business people, 20 to 40% of entrepreneurs have got dyslexia. 40% of architects, designers, and art teachers, our art students have got dyslexia, and about 50% of people in jail have got dyslexia. So, you know, oh, you, <laughs> you turn one way or the other, you know, you become an entrepreneur or you go to jail. It, it, it's not as black and white as that, but it, it's interesting. We tend to live on the outlier scale, you know, in different activities. But going back to art students and discovering why they're doing art, okay? For me, I've got an artistic background in myself as well. I always thought of art as a way of expressing, I don't know, love and helping people to see the world around them. Whenever I saw artists really, the, the art that I looked at often helped me see the world differently once I'd seen the art. And there was something about, I, and I even saw that when my daughter painted, both of my daughters painted, they would paint like a cat or something and it would be extraordinary. And I'd look at it, I'd look at cats differently after I'd seen that art. And it was like, because they had seen something that I had seen, but I was blind to, I, I had just taken for granted. But once it had been highlighted by a piece of art, I then saw it so much more clearly. And I wondered, you know, so I, I think of that as a form of translation. It's like when you're walking down the street and someone says, oh, did you see that bird over there? And you go, bird? Oh, yeah, I see it now. 
And it was in your field of view, but you didn't see it. You didn't recognize it until someone pointed it out. Could you talk to young artists as to, you know, what your advice would be to them as they're discovering why they're doing art? Well, you know, wow, that's a lot to unpack, but let, let me see if I can scratch the surface of it. I think the word seeing, you know, is a really important word having to not only do with art, but in any creative field. And I think, you know, some people I think think art is the only creative field. Science is really creative. Any kind of problem solving, being an entrepreneur, trying to solve a problem, you know, using whatever toolbox that you use, you know, in, in your career is important. But I think if you remain curious, and, and actually, I think curiosity if, if I could pick one thing that I could equate my journey to, it's the big C word, curiosity and the creative process. But I think it always starts with curiosity because if you're curious, you can look at anything and you can find meaning in it. And actually right now I'm working at Penn <laughs> with a group a scientific group that studies curiosity, like what goes on in our heads to make us curious. Oh my God, that, that was such a gift, the timing of that, because it was right before the pandemic, it turned into an exhibition and it made me realize that's one of the things that connects us as human beings is curiosity. And so I, you know, in the question about how to nurture, because I think that's the question you were asking me with children, is to just nurture a sense of curiosity, whether that means taking a child to different things, seeing different things, creating an environment that's rich. Like if you came to my home and studio, I have so much, many things around here that have meaning to me. I'm very interested in, in stones, crystals, shells, African art. So when you walk into my home, it's like walking into my head because you're able to see the things that feed me and nurture me. And, and most of us, as we get older, we intuitively know that as parents, you know, when you were talking about your daughters, you intuit based on your life journey, what you think would enrich them. But, but what I would say, hands down, if you can create a, an accepting environment that enables students, young people to be curious, that is the greatest gift you can give another human being. Yeah. I mean, I tried to do that in my teaching career, you know, is to hold that light for others. And I do it now when I lecture, when I go into audiences of people I don't even know. It's just that important to me. Can you see a difference between students who have got dyslexia that are doing art and those who don't? Do, are you aware? I, I, do you know which students have got dyslexia and which don't? Well, actually, when I was teaching, which, you know, I retired 10 years ago, I started when I was five. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I, I don't think you were even allowed to ask those questions. You know, there really? there period of time where that kind of information wasn't disclosed. I can tell you though, towards the tail end of my teaching career, that was being disclosed more. And if I I had several students who I work with that had Asperger's and other neurodiverse challenges. Let me just put it to you that way. And what was interesting, students that had Asperger's, they were incredible if you could get them to focus in terms of design. What is the other thing, Asperger's and- Autism? Autism, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Autism. thank you. And I've had in my career, several autistic students. They were incredible if you could get them to focus in terms of design, because the way their brains are wired, their attention to detail, I, 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 I observe, really enabled them to focus. Some of them requested that they had to listen to music when they work, you know, with earbuds or, or headphones. And my feeling is that's fine, just as long as it doesn't disturb other people. 
I think of it often, if you think of our minds as lenses mm -hmm. for a camera, mm -hmm. a camera lens, there are some people's camera lens, which is very wide angled, like a fisheye lens, and other people's are typical frame. And then others are very zoomed in and, and have very detailed view of something, but a, a short area that they cover. And, and different people's minds shift in those zones. Even our attention goes wide angled and then zooms in at like a telephoto zoom lens. And some people are a bit like that, their default state. And I would say people with dyslexia often have a default state of being much wide angled lenses. And then autism, often much more zoomed in and high definition zoomed in and dyslexia, lower definition, but a big wide view. Actually, thank you. That's a really great way of, or an analogy of, of thinking about that range of neurodiversity. Yeah. Actually, what happened about a year ago, a group reached out to me from San Francisco and they were doing this exhibition on dyslexic artists. And, and the curator said that she had been a fan of my work. She had seen it online and was hoping I might be willing to, you know, contribute to the exhibition. And I said, of course, because any invitation is always an opportunity to learn something new about yourself that you could potentially share with others. And that's sort of the way I like to, to operate. And it took me on an incredible journey, which I, I was so thankful that I was working with this complexity systems group at Penn. And they came up, well, they used the word neurodiverse. And I thought, oh, wow, that's a, that's a great term that I had never really heard of before. And I work with this doctoral student who I've been working with for about the last three or four years. And he came up with this really great idea. He said, you know, we can take some of the artwork that you have created. And because so much of of our collaborative practice has been you describing your process of discovery, we can animate that into the piece of sculptures or the sculptures that you've created. So people could get a sense of what happens when you conceive ideas, you know, how they morph in your head. And it was really fascinating to me because you know, working on that exhibition really made me focus on my process of discovery as a dyslexic person, because I'd, I'd never really done that before. And what I came to learn is that when I read a book, and the first thing I tell students when I, you know, go lecture to junior high and high school students is like some of them, I struggle with reading, and I still do. I don't read for enjoyment. I spent a lot of time in libraries researching, but I don't sit down, put my feet up and read a book just to relax. It's very stressful for me to do that. And I don't always remember what I'm reading. But what I found is when, and I just learned this last year, was when I read a book, I don't really read words. I'm, I'm seeing images. And now that makes perfect sense that, I gravitated towards art because it was a way of translating my view of the world, you know, through That's images. Fascinating because I think this word translate is, is so important. I, I know when I'm working with children and adults as a, I'm a dyslexia productivity coach. So I help them become productive dreamers. So stay dreaming, stay imagining, but have tools at hand that help them be productive as a creative person. And, and what I've noticed is that translating words into images are crucial for people with dyslexia often. And once they can translate the information that's coming to them and translate it into their natural language, which is often a very visual, or dynamic language, then they can really relate to it. And then they have to go through the opposite process 
of taking that visual language and often turning it back into words to communicate it to someone. Although if you're an artist, you can stay in the visual realm and communicate it through your art. So it is, and isn't it fascinating that so many people with dyslexia are so used to translating and distilling right. often lots of common words, lots, a whole blizzard of words and distilling it down into pithy phrases, pithy concepts, principles. That's often what they're trying to do is constantly distill, 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 and find the essence and, and principles involved. Because what I've noticed with people with dyslexia often they're maybe not good at remembering the details, but they're great at remembering the principles. Right. Because right. they're operating on, they're hardwired to see past details and try and find overarching patterns. And then they try and extrapolate from those patterns to recreate the details. So for example, if they're reading, they'll, they'll read and try and find the context. And maybe they've not read everything very well. So they try and fill in the information by imagine, oh yeah, it must have been X and Y Z. And they're unconsciously filling in the gaps all the time. But that's part of the creative process to fill in gaps. But if you're being scientific, you might not fill in the gaps accurately. But the whole point of it is we're hardwired to find those principles and extract them and hold on to them. No, actually, you've given me a lot of insight. And because as someone who's dyslexic, I have not been real cognizant of how I process information. One of the things I do, and I was talking about this last night in this lecture, was one of the ways I process things is by PowerPoint. And I have hundreds and hundreds of PowerPoints of process of discovery. And I find that when I share, if I'm trying to understand something and I can do it through a PowerPoint, I can take it out and show it to people. And people are fascinated by that because most people just don't distill. And I love that word that you use, distill things to its essence. But yet- well, most you've got to tell us, you've got to tell us about your, your process now. I mean, you've <laughs> intrigued me with what is Rebecca's process of art discovery and your artistic process and now you've said you use powerpoint now i didn't expect you to be using powerpoint i mean most people think of death by powerpoint with lots of words and so on but i'm going to guess your powerpoints don't have very many words so if you could this is fascinating could you just talk us through your artistic process and maybe tell us a little bit about how you use powerpoint as well sure well, actually, I'll share with you what I shared with this group last night. Words will come into my head, I, and, and all of a sudden, they seem important. They're not relevant at the moment, but I just sort of tuck them in my hard drive. And for instance, I had this very interesting experience. I was getting ready for this big lecture last night that dealt with my process of discovery for working with this exhibition. And again, this was the exhibition where I was commissioned to create artwork that sort of showcased and reimagined the scientific discovery of these women scientists. And, and most of them I didn't know, which was fascinating to me because I realized most of the research I've done for the last 25, 30 years has been male oriented. And, and these were women. This was a show specifically women from the last 300 years. So anyway, as I mentioned, that first manuscript that was sent to me was from 1770. So it was the earliest manuscript in this, you know, exhibition. And it was beautiful. It was handwritten as before they invented the smartphone and all these distractions that we have in our life. And I love the fact it was a male scientist sending it to a female scientist because he knew as a physicist, she would really enjoy finding out about this. So I'm putting this PowerPoint together for last night. And all of a sudden, you know, I have the first image is me under the Aurora Borealis, and then this beautiful manuscript. And then I see the date 1770. And about a week ago, I thought, wow, 
I wonder what happened in 1770 that might have triggered this scientific phenomena. So <laughs> being the person, the curious person I am, I dialed up solar activity 1770. Oh my God, it was like falling down the rabbit hole of possibility. Not only was there all this written information, but there were these beautiful, beautiful drawings. A lot of them came from Korea and Asia of people trying to capture this scientific phenomena with a drawing. So I, I included one in my lecture last night and I said, this is how my brain works. I've been putting together this presentation for months, you know, because I knew it was going to be last night. And I'm the kind of person that's always still open to learning something new, even though I've committed it to my PowerPoint. And I wanted them to see my process of discovery because I saw 1770 and I, knowing what I do, you know, a little bit about the, the, the dynamics of how the Aurora Borealis works, I knew there had to be some type of significant activity that must have happened in 1770. And sure enough, it was one of the major solar disturbances that's been recorded, or one of the earliest ones. So, and I love the fact that without a smartphone, <laughs> people were able to capture their observation and I got to be the receptor of it 300 years later that I could be excited about it, I could learn by it, and I could share it with others. Fantastic. So do you have like a PowerPoint that's just open on a particular topic and you add different slides to it as you go along? Or is it kind of like, you know how an artist might have like an artist journal and you journal different things and you put different images and so on. Are you using a PowerPoint a bit like that? Or do you use PowerPoint at the end to sort of map out what's already happened? Well, actually, you bring up a really good point because people say to me, how come you don't use a sketchbook? And it's interesting. I guess I'm really wired for visuals because... I find that when I look up something, and, and actually part of the study, the curiosity study at the University of Pennsylvania was based on how people researched in Wikipedia. That was their study. And it was knowledge network over time. And so they would load something on your computer, a software that could monitor how people were researching. And it, that was really fascinating to me. And at one point I said to my colleague, this is great. And yes, I do use Wikipedia, but I'm more of a visual learner. So I'm the type of person that goes to Google images. I'm looking at images and I'm capturing them, you know, and I never thought about that until our dialogue today. But to answer your question, I, so I use PowerPoint as my sketchbook and oh, wow. like right now, I'm very interested as a result of this aurora borealis, this veil of magic that has surrounded me because of that experience. Um, and I'm very fortunate because I have a colleague at American University in Washington, DC, who's what's called a heliophysicist. So a heliophysicist is a physicist that studies the sun and, and her research is the solar corona. And that actually got me interested when I met with her three years ago before this big exhibition and before the pandemic about the relationship of solar corona, which is the macro, and coronavirus. And what I found, and this was so interesting because I did a lot, a lot of lecturing during the pandemic to scientists, believe it or not, it was really fascinating. But what happened was when I showed the physicists, you know, who are looking at solar, what I observed from dealing with microscopists who are dealing with micro, I said, what was fascinating to me, it was the same dynamic, but at a different scale. And so these are the kinds of things that I capture through PowerPoint and that I use. Like right now, I'm very interested in solar dynamics, and I'm not sure where it's gonna lead me and its relationship, are you ready, to volcanoes. 
So I think in my future, you're going to see a lot of disruption and eruption. <laughs> Have you got one that you could show us just now, just to give us an idea of how you do your PowerPoints? Well, I can actually, funny you should mention that. Let me see if I can get this to work. I can now, show you the PowerPoint I did last night. So this was a talk that dealt with curiosity and the creative process, dealing with the art of reimagining discoveries of women or women scientists. And so this is how I started. And I, I mentioned to you an image of me at the Aurora Borealis. And that's a beautiful manuscript that I was discussing from 1770. And my latest discovery below it was this drawing depicting the Aurora's scene from Kyoto. And wow. it, the same time, which I would have never discovered had I not thought, wow, solar activity is happening in 1770, and this is all over the world. And I was stunned. So I was pretty excited about that. And then I talk about, in this thing, I talked about a uh, sense of wonder. This was a book my parents gifted me when I was probably about nine or 10 years old. And then this very famous painting by Marcel Duchamp, which is in the collection at the Philadelphia Art Museum that I was taken to when I was in the fifth grade and it was a life-changing experience. The significance of this painting for me, and I share it all the time when I'm invited to lecture to physicists, is it deals with space and time. Yeah, and so it's a picture for those who are listening of a yellowish ochre picture of it looks like a person walking down steps in time lapse, but it's lots of little triangular shapes. It's very cubist kind of feel. And you you know that it's a person moving down the steps, but you kind of don't know how that's even happening. But yeah, just so you know. And this was probably painted in the 1940s. So this is mm -hmm. before we had <laughs> even knew how to even think about this in this way. So this was very revolutionary. So these are two historic images of how people thought curiosity worked. One is Rene Descartes and then Robert Flood. One's a philosopher. And, and the other word I wanted to mention was natural philosopher, because the, before the invention of the word scientist, people that practice observation, scientific observation, were called natural philosophers. I tend to think of myself more in the realm of a natural philosopher. Uh, this is the knot study I mentioned, and this is, you know, one of their little, as they would call them, cartoons to talk about the different ways people acquire knowledge using mm -hmm. Wikipedia. These are three different categories. The busybody who deals with discrete bits of information, the hunter who's more targeted, very, you know, myopic when they're looking, you know, for information. And I'm the third category, the dancer, who deals with very discontinuous concepts, stringing knowledge networks that enable me to produce what I do. And that this was from the catalog from that exhibition. And then what I did basically, and I'll just run through this, was to showcase younger women scientists who I've been collaborating with, who really are on the shoulders of these scientists from 300 years who are in this current exhibition. And is this, this your work as yeah, well? Yeah, this is all my work. Oh my um, goodness. So the image on the left is the scientists and, and their scientific data, their information. This is Danny Bassett, who deals with the complex system labs. She's the principal there. And this is a piece I did called The Architecture of Knowledge. This was a woman at American University who studies the cerebellum. I never got to meet with her, but she was generous enough to send me her research. And what was interesting to me about the cerebellum, it's like a miniature brain in that it has two hemispheres. It sits on the back of your neck. But what's really significant to me personally is it has the greatest diversity of neurons. And that's what I was trying to capture in the way I painted this particular piece of artwork. Could I just ask you, why is, why is there so much blue on it? Does the blue is beautiful and the 
what's the significance of the blue well, neuron looking yeah, uh, patterns they're, there? Yeah, they're, they represent neurons. And I always like to think of neurons. They're very, you know, what flows through neurons as almost like fluid water. So they're okay. pathways, you know, and that's what neurons provide in our brain. They're pathways. Like a river is a pathway for water. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And because it's art, I get to choose the colors. The <laughs> I'm in the driver's seat. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. This was the real breakthrough. The other thing I didn't mention was in 2019, I was invited to American University to start meeting with scientists. This was the first scientist I got to meet, the woman, that the heliophysicist. The day after I met with her, I was going to get up to do a physics colloquium. I, I woke up in terrible vertigo and had to be rushed to the hospital only to find out I had a brain tumor, wow. uh, which was profound. But being the person that I am, that was Tuesday. I was released from the hospital Thursday. Friday, I presented a lecture. And I have to say, at American University, the Dean of Arts and Science was there. I, I knew I had to do it. I was still in terrible vertigo, but I just hopped on to the lectern. And I think I gave one of the best lectures I ever gave. And then the pandemic hit. But it, 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 you know, do you it, still have the tumor? It, I had surgery. It was benign. But as a result of that, it enabled me to, well, it didn't enable me, but I had terrible double and triple vision in the recovery. And being the kind of person I am, I went into my studio and I started painting. I did a painting a day of, it was like a visual diary of what my world was like, because I knew at some point that would be that would go away, which you wanted to. It took about four to six weeks. And I found out by putting prisms in my glasses that sort of took care of that problem. But these paintings were part of this exhibition and people were fascinated by it. But it's, it's funny. Is this a terrible thing to say? But it looks a bit like food. The sculpture does? Yeah, it does. Well, it was inspired by solar, corona, and the coronavirus. Oh, I see. So it's it's sort of a macro view. It's like viewing from the sun going all the way down to my. And those are the coronaviruses in the middle there. Yes. Yes. I've got you. Fantastic. Which I'm so sorry for all those who are listening on the audio just now. You really need to go and see this part visually and. What I'll do is I will. I can put, send you images. Yeah, if you'd like. I'll put the link for this section that Rebecca is sharing that is very visual into the show notes of the podcast. And I'll put it on YouTube so you can click on it and you can just watch this particular bit, oh. the visual bit, so that people can really see how you've taken the inspiration and transformed it. It's really lovely to see how you've transformed your original inspiration into the actual piece. Please carry on. Yeah. So what was interesting for me is during the pandemic, everyone was on lockdown and I connected with these scientists who by doing research online, I thought, oh, wow, that looks interesting. This is a woman at the University of York who does mathematical virology, which was fascinating to me. And what she was investigating were pathways that could be used for the pandemic to, to eradicate the virus. And again, you know, it was all through email. And so it made me realize that one of the significant things about the virus is its geometry. And it's a sosahedron. And it was also the same geometry of, of another physics professor I got to work with who did a project which research he titles quantum quilts. And I love the idea of thinking of the world of quantum as this beautiful quilt. And so that's what happened. It's like, oh, wow, geometry. It, this is the language of art and science right here. And so that became a really important component for this research that I was doing. So was that what you just showed me? That's okay. a three-dimensional object on the right-hand side. 
Correct. Made from acrylic. And have you been, have you painted on the top of the acrylic or is it embedded in the acrylic? No, no, I'm painting. And all the material that you're seeing here is acrylic on mylar. So mylar is a plastic substrate that I've been working with probably about 35 years. So what is mylar? Is that when you say a plastic substrate, is it a sheet or is it yes. like yes. a... Yes, it comes in sheets. Um, and you glue it together or do you cut it or what? No, I, in the case of these pieces, these were all scored and folded to create the geometric forms. I see. And how thin is that? They're, it's like paper. paper. I think. Oh, I see. So it's yeah. really quite thin. Okay, got you. Thank you. Sure. Keep going. This is fantastic. This is like a <laughs> well, journey of discovery. I'm loving this. Well, no. And I know the people last night, I couldn't leave. They just wanted to engage in dialogue, which you know made me feel like I was successful in getting their curiosity going. But anyway, the, the image on the left is my brain on curiosity. These are all the pathways that were engaged in all the research and artwork I created for that exhibition. So you see it as a static form. And then on the right, you see it as a dynamic form. So um, it's being data visualized courtesy of Dale Zhao. How... Is he deciding or she, is Dale a female? Male. Right. How is that being, the data being taken? Is it? Well, what according to this, he says the circle represents a word describing an idea. It's based on semantics. It's, it's based on me describing using language. Autistic oh. process. So, so yeah. this is a visual expression of the language you're using to describe your artistic process. Exactly, exactly. This is very similar to the way artificial intelligence uses language. Have you have you done any work with artificial intelligence? And that's what I'm talking language? about. That's how we did the whole dyslexic project was all artificial intelligence. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It'll blow you away. And since you, I can bring this up now, I'll show you a little clip so you can see it. Oh, I'd love to, because I'm really fascinated by, you know, the way that artificial intelligence is trying to learn the relationship of words to one another, just for listeners, is that it creates a vector space, a three-dimensional vector space. And it's not taught to do this. It just does this. And so what it does is it says, oh, cat and dog. I hear people talking about cat and dog a lot. So I put cat and dog over here close to each other. And then there's maybe horse and horse is an animal, but it's not as close as cat and dog. But pet is very close to cat and dog, but kind of close to horse. And so what it does is it sort of positions, but then horse is really close to farm and starts to arrange all these words and rearrange all these words in this three-dimensional space and then it understands the words as literal vectors it doesn't understand them as ver words it understand right. them as vectors in relation to one another so chat gpt4 now can speak so intuitively as an expert in biological sciences because it's understood that when an expert in biological sciences speaks these kind of vectors of words tend to be close to one another compared to a person in biology or in art. They speak a bit differently. And so it vectors it according to the area of interest and expertise as well. Or it can rearrange the vectors according to that area of expertise or interest. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was eye opening for me. And according to Dale, he said that this will mimic the way your brain processes information. And so this was part of that exhibition. And mm -hmm. it's going to be part of a new project. It, it might be possibly a part of a new project that I'm embarking on at Penn. I've been sort of giving it birth for five years. It's, okay. been, it's really been a journey, but I know I have to trust because when I trust, all things are possible. And I think that's really true of anyone. 
can I pause you on that for a moment and just sure. drill down into that giving birth thing? Is this a common thing with you? Because I see this in myself and I see this with other people who are very creative. Often they've got the germ of an idea that has maybe been growing quietly in the background for five years, 10 years, 30 years. And then they're like, I know it's growing there, but I know it's not quite the time for that. And, and there's, it's like a garden of thoughts and ideas that are sort of germinating and growing. But then there's a moment where you kind of bring it out into the light and work on it, you know, and it blossoms. Are you referring to something, a dynamic like that? Absolutely. And I find when I'm struggling, and I'll give you an example, I did a big project on the periodic table of elements. And it's a fun story because I was invited to Chile to do lecturing. This was like around 2009. And I came into my living room after this overseas flight from Chile. And I had this vision. I was supposed to do something with the periodic table of elements. And I thought, jet lag, bad food. I mean, <laughs> who thinks about the periodic? You know, I wasn't even working with that, you know, when I was in Chile. And so anyway, I know myself well enough that that is always an invitation, and I'm using the word invitation, to research something that I know very little about. The irony is the last science class I had, formal science class, was 11th grade chemistry. And I have chemists that say to me, how do you know all this stuff? And it's, I'm curious, you know? And so I spent a year and a half researching the periodic table of elements. I took it all the way back down to alchemy. You know, I went to a research facility that just had incredible collections of alchemy. And so I just, just research, research, research. My research took me high up in the Himalayas. What I realized when I was in the Himalayas that that rigid gridded chart of Mendeleev's is really our cosmology because it represents the world above, below, and everything in between. And once I had that epiphany, then I went back into my studio and spent another year and a half being inspired by the electron orbital patterns of the first 83 naturally occurring elements. And boy, I have to tell you, when I present that, people are like blown away. And at a certain point, I thought, this needs sound because I set it up as a garden based on a Fibonacci spiral. And the whole idea was you would walk through this and it would be this garden to contemplate, you know, thinking about, you know, the elements that surround us, that are in us, surround us. I had chemists emailing me from around the world saying, I never thought of what I did is beautiful. Thank you. Because it was really written up all over. And I think, you know, when people say, what is your favorite? I think that has to be a breakthrough piece for me because I work with a woman in California who was researching what I was, but through sound. And so what she was able to do through a Lemur frequency was to capture the vibrations of these orbiting electrons and translate it into sound. And you can go on my website and you can see it and hear it. But even when I show it, people are really moved by it, you know, and I think the reason they are is because it represents what makes them up as human beings and the world around them, but it awakens that in them. Um, Fantastic. We'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes so people can go directly to that presentation. And circling this back to the question I asked, that was something that was bubbling away inside of you before then or or oh did it just God. come no i mean it, i got a message i know this is going to sound weird but i literally walked into my home from getting off of a plane fr from chile and the message was i was supposed to do something with the periodic table of elements i thought oh my god what this is crazy and that really was one of the first major art installations that I did. You know, it, it, like I said, I think it was like 2008. If you don't mind me asking, are you used to speaking spiritually or, you know, religious? What's your kind of, are you just science or do you also have some faith? 
I, I, I find that this is all interconnected and I actually, I'm getting ready to come to your neck of the woods. I'm, I'm doing a trip in next September. I'm going to sacred sites in Ireland oh, and really? I'm really excited because at, oh, I'm so excited to share the story with you because one of the projects I was invited to do some woman reached out to me from Australia around 2018, and she introduced herself and said, you know, I'm really excited about your work. I saw it online. And would you be willing to be part of an exhibition that is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 lunar landing? And I said, absolutely. I can remember being a waitress in college watching that on a little black and white TV. So I wanted to be an astronaut. That was my journey when I was a kid. And, you know, I'm old enough that I saw, I witnessed that and how transformative that was. And so anyway, I thought, why would people in Australia be interested in this to do an exhibition? Little did I not know that the Parks Observatory was responsible for us seeing Neil Armstrong walking on the moon because of where that, the timing of that in relationship to that communication link. So if it wasn't for Parks Observatory, I would have never seen it as a waitress, a college age waitress. And so that was the catalyst for them to do this exhibition. As it turns out, my collaborating partner and I were the only ones from the United States. Everyone else was Australian. But the reason I'm bringing this up is we were asked to do a video. And you can see this on my website. It's called Plot, P-L-O-T. And part of my research uncovered this incredible place in Ireland called Noth. And it's a cave and it has some of the earliest carvings of man trying to capture what they're understanding about the moon. Where is it in Ireland? It's in this place called Noth. Is it north, south, east, west, do you know? I don't even know. It's like you know, the funny thing is, I just did a sailing expedition from the north of Ireland in the, to Iona, which is a sacred site in Scotland. And I did it in a dinghy, a 16-foot open dinghy. And <laughs> I've been building up to this for about 15 years. And in the old days, Colum Kill, St. Columba, sailed from Ballantoy, the north of Ireland, Ballycastle, the north of Ireland, across to Scotland, Isla and Jura, and around to the island of Iona, and set up his base camp in Scotland there, in the island of Iona. And so I've got a connection to Ireland as well, in, in that we took the boat across there, and we took a hand-stitched boat and sailed it across over to there. So yeah, That's Iona, incredible. Ireland's a great place. <laughs> well, and I've never been there. I've spent some time in England. But to answer your question, I consider myself more a spiritual person. And I'll just share this story. I'm very intuitive. It's just the gift I've had since I've been a little girl. And when things cross my path, whether they're people, places, objects, things, I, I know to listen to them, especially if I sense that there's some kind of light or, or unit of truth that, that it can share with me. And that's more the type of person that I am. I'm, I'm a very open channel, you know, for information. And wherever I feel I can, it, where it comes from, you know, I, I love traveling to ancient places. I, I've traveled to India. I've been to Bhutan. I've been to Burma. Really ancient places, ancient sites that I feel really communicate to me, you know, and to me, it's always an act of faith. You have to always have an open mind and an open heart. And then things get revealed. And that's a lot of what inspires my work. Fantastic. Could you go back to your slideshow and show us some more Absolutely. pictures, Absolutely. We haven't even gotten to the good part yet. 
Yeah, so let's go back to your presentation and have a look at some of these pictures. And while you're sharing your presentation or getting it queued up, there's one thing having a presentation that you've a PowerPoint you've created for others. But I'm right. also keen to see what kind of PowerPoints you create just for yourself. Do you just create PowerPoints for yourself as an artist sketchbook? Do you just add a picture to it? Or how does that work? Usually it, it, it centers around a, a concept that sort of comes into my head. Okay. Like, for instance, this notion of Corona. I, I had been, you know, doing research with this physicist who was dealing with the sun's Corona. And then, so that was tucked in my head. And then all of a sudden the coronavirus happened. And I remember coming home on the train from the University of Pennsylvania. And I thought, wow, I wonder if there's some type of connection between that word Corona. And so what I found, and I'm going to move forward, I'll show you this, because I think it'll make more sense. This image here, this is what I showed last night, and I call it Corona Dynamics. And so what's happening is you're seeing what the sun's Corona does, which is what creates the magic for the Aurora Borealis, and it's very similar to the spike protein dynamic that happened in the coronavirus or happens in the coronavirus. Now, what was interesting as a thank you, and I, I do this sometimes, I was working with a group of microscopists at Dr. Anthony Fauci's lab, and they were really generous sharing their images with me. And so I said, look, to reciprocate, I'd love to do a lecture for your colleagues in your lab. Oh my God, it was so wonderful. And I'll never forget one of the young lab members said to me, he was so moved with how eloquently I described their process of discovery, you know? And that really meant a lot to me because I just always lecture from the heart. I really do. I mean, I, I take this, but then it always comes through the heart. And I think that's why people resonate with the content of what I share with them because it's not just data. I'm trying to make it more poetic and make them think about it in a different way. Like, mm. was the coronavirus scary? Absolutely. But for me, it kept me going, waking up every morning and working on this project to try to understand what, it, what its meaning was for me personally. Mm. And that's what I lecture about when I talk about it. So these are two of the images from, and these, it happened to be two women. So that's why it was included in my talk last night. But you can see the image. Do you see the image on the left? Yes. That, that inspired that piece. And that is the coronavirus in the middle with those spike proteins? Yeah. Yeah. Great. That's one of the earliest images. And, and actually the question last night, and it was a very good one, was, how, how come it's colorized? And it's true because when, when you see images from outer space, it's, it's always chromatic or black, white, and gray, and it's always enhanced by colorization. Well, the same thing's true with this as well. You know, Anita, who's the team leader in the visual medical arts, she always takes the microscopy images and they work with it and heighten it through Photoshop. And I asked them about that. And they said, the reason they do that is so they can see the content better than if it's just all gray, you know. I so there's something about the color that helps them see some of the textures better and shapes better. And the relationship of forms, like where they are in relationship. Oh, I see. So you're starting to see color pattern. I see. And the one on the right for those who are listening, is a green background with a blue blob, like a cell in the middle, and then all these little yellow dots, and you can see different clusters of yellow. Exactly, exactly. So, so this is what I love, what I get to do. <laughs> okay, so this was a book that I found called The Space Child's Mother Goose, and it was just happened across my, as I call it, my event horizon. And I was able to purchase it. And Sylvania, she's my friend and colleague who's the heliophysicist. And so anyway, this is, and this is power tool revealing the creative process. For this one, this one was showing 
what's going on in my head, you know, some of the different processes of how I process information and am able to talk about it with neuroscientists for this project. Then I have an arrow showing this book and Savini and I, it was great. Zoom, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, you and I are connected now and, you know, during the pandemic, it was great because you could really not feel that alone. But anyway, what I'm showing here is some of my process of discovery from my dialogue with her as a solar physicist and Eugene Parker, who really was at the beginning of a lot of solar research. And actually, the new, there's a big solar observation thing that's named after him. And so what I've done is I've juxtaposed some of the images from the Mother Goose book with that. And you can see that one that says circa 1958. And it, to me, in my world, they look so similar. Gosh, it's just so beautiful. I just love it. You know, in my repository, I had this is one of the PowerPoints that I have. And I put it together because I was so excited when I started seeing all these relationships that I wanted to share it with my colleagues in the complex system lab. And I also wanted to share it with Sylvania, you know, because I wanted these two groups to see how researching and conversations with both groups of people enabled me to, as you see at the end, create that piece of sculpture. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, so, and then this is what the artwork looked like installed in the museum. It, 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 it looks quite big. Is that big? How big is that center piece that's the biggest? Is it like bigger than a head? No. Yeah. Yeah. There it's about 32 inches by 32 inches. Oh, wow. Okay. And those Fantastic. three pieces now are in the permanent collection of the physics department at American university. And actually I was just up there two weeks ago for a formal dedication and to present at a physics colloquium to physicists. And, you know, with a- So beautiful. So beautiful. I mean, it's achingly beautiful. <laughs> Well, that's the virus. So. Yeah. <laughs> and really, I, I really wanted people to reimagine why scientists spend so much of their time. That It's their passion. They see it as beautiful, too. Yes, does yes. it have a destructive edge? Very much so. But there's yeah. beauty in that, too. And yeah. Is your art for sale? Do people go and buy it to exhibitions and things like that? Sometimes, sometimes. But, you know, what I really have been doing recently, I like ha having my art in scientific spaces. A lot of the work that was created when I was an artist in residence, I actually wanted to gift to the National Institute of Health. So they have about 12 or 13 pretty good sized pieces in their collection because what I want at this point in my career is that my work inspires others, especially scientists. And okay, so I, you want it in a more public space rather than privately held in someone's lounge? Yeah, I mean, or... people do. Don't get me wrong. People do purchase it. But I'm always really excited when it can go into places where I feel like it's going to inspire others to think creatively and be innovative, especially in science, because there's so many things to solve. Show me more pictures. <laughs> this one I put in because someone had looked at this, this is Corona number three, and said, wow, that looks like the dancing Shiva. And I went, oh my God, I have one of those in my studio. Yes. This particular one's at CERN, which is that Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And I love the fact that a place like CERN, they would have this in the front of their building. And I juxtaposed it with the tale of physics, you know, which it talks about subatomical particles, that it's an energy dance. And actually, what I will show you after we're through with this is Dale, my collaborating partner, took this sculpture, took this language, and you it ran it through AI to transform that sculpture. And I have to tell you, when he sent it back to me, I was so blown away. Oh, it, fantastic. Did he yeah, use Midjourney or something like that? What did he I'm use? I'm sorry? Did he use Midjourney? 
I don't, I can send you information on that. That'll be fantastic. So he basically used your image as a reference image of this Corona, then the language that you've got there. And then describe it, it. Yeah. it translated that into another image. And I'll show it to you today before we get off the thing. Oh, could you show it to us now? So it's in context. Okay. All right. So for this exhibition, the the dyslexic exhibition in San Francisco last year, what I decided to do was to have this image of the data visualization of what makes me curious and juxtapose images that were inspired by this, okay, or what this represents. All right. So let me hit this on full view. Are you ready? Fasten your seatbelts. I'm ready. Bring it on. <laughs> so this this is the prompt. So this is the image where it's animated illustrations representing how the dyslexic brain interprets information. So it says the animation start from artwork, and in this case, Corona 3, and then morphs into slightly different images according to some guided prompts. And these prompts, the texts are taken from PowerPoint presentation describing Corona 3 artwork, vehicles of discovery, dance of creation and destruction, an energy dance, a pulsating process of creation and destruction, and in the style of German zoologist Ernst Haeckel. Okay, are you ready? Oh wait my goodness. Wait a minute, wait. Here we go. Oh. Oh <laughs> my. <laughs> wow. And I don't know Hegel's work. Is that like Hegel's work? Oh my God, you got. He's a whole other lecture. So here's the D. Oh my God, my battery's getting low. Let, I'll tell you what, let me plug this in. I have a very dear friend of mine who is a poet in London. And we met as fellows in Salzburg, the Salzburg, Salzburg Global Seminar in 2015. And Steve and I would have a competition about who had the best socks. And he said, I won. And I agree, I think I did, but his were pretty good. And so anyway, Steve and I have been collaborating on many, many projects. And he's so wonderful. When I reached out to him about this one, he he created this poem called Cayman's Lens. And so it was inspired by emails that he and I write back and forth to each other. And I have to tell you, I'm really challenged with writing. But for some reason, when I write emails to him, they're so poetic and he's used them as the basis for creating poems himself when we collaborate. So anyway, he wrote this beautiful series of poems based on these paintings that I did that's called Cayman's Lens. And so what you're going to see now is that painting and the language of Stephen interpreted through AI. To understand things in relationship to other things, to decode written words or symbols, the occipital temporal lobe just above the cerebellum, disrupted like a distant music, a sound that knew that which was applied to the periodic table. Western cosmology, a garden inspired by the orbital patterns, the 83 naturally occurring elements. He's talking about my project, Divining Nature, which is the yeah. pure able. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is the whole poem. And I'll just show you, you this briefly so you can get an idea. But Cayman's Lens by S.J. Fowler with an epigraph by Rebecca Cayman. An awakening seems to occur when presenting scientific findings interpreted through the eyes of a dyslexic artist. Before the word, something so small that we couldn't see, the cosmos, personal, the neuronal excitement, 
random but parallel occurrences on continents seem to be aligning. Revelation seems to be intentions, black holes and growth cones, cutouts reminiscent of the seen, from the finite material of the invisible, the vast and intense motion of complexity, the billions of cells made visible. How ironic, Sidurius Nuncius, the invitation seems some type of profound messenger whose potential is of the lens, the lens of data, of visual knowing, the translational lens in our body, an inner voice directed me, the expressive drawn lines of trees and shells, a molecular phenomena I have interpreted and transformed. Four artists of the first slide, the quartet correspondence of consciousness, the quintessential word implying the potential, correspondence in definition of the written word, Brzezka's drawings, the explosion of bullets, the sculpture flare, bullets in relationship to solar magnetic force, each is preceded by a written fragment. We are since that part of the vocabulary. We are my hands. We are the minor major that doesn't require math. We are the child of light that's held. The brain and unexpected difficulty is the story of the table upon which we eat. Despite intelligence, motivation and education. To understand things in relationship to other things to decode written words or symbols, the occipital temporal lobe just above the cerebellum, disrupted like a distant music, a sound that knew that which was applied to the periodic table. Western cosmology, a garden inspired by the orbital patterns, the 83 naturally occurring elements a glimpse into the nature of seeds, the notion of a type of neo-theosophy with much gratitude mirrored back through, the evolution of thought as it has been watching, unfolded, nourished by the witness into abstract form with sculptural structures within the vehicle for processing, the anti-written language and infancy as it continues to reveal. Yeah, so that's basically the whole suite of poems. Um, so so let me just, that's fantastic. I'm just going to process that for a moment, please. Sorry, yeah. So, so was that all artificially ge generated by AI in response to the words and the art you gave it? Absolutely. That was, yes. And that was one of my contributions to this exhibition. And my collaboration with Dale, who I've been working with probably since about 2018 or 2019. Yeah. So how, how do you feel as an artist? This is a very topical thing. You know, how do you feel about generative AI and art? And as an artist yourself, I mean, you're you're an abstract artist in many ways in what you're doing. And right. how do you feel about AI art? In the way that I'm using it, I look at everything as a possibility. Do I understand how it works? Not really. Do I see the potential of it being dangerous? Anything is. If I eat too many hot fudge sundaes, that could be dangerous too. But for me, it provided an opportunity to see how my brain processes itself. It, it was a means to an end that a collaborating partner of mine suggested could work really well as a way of mimicking how my brain processes information and to be able to share that with other people so they would have an idea of how a dyslexic brain works. Do you think that was an accurate representation or a, a, a useful representation of the way your brain does process information? 
Well, let me just say anything that gets me going and thinking about things and get people excited it, it is a positive way. I, in my wildest expectations, never ever thought I would ever engage in AI. And when you did? It's opened up all kinds of possibilities for some upcoming projects. But so do you yeah. think people in the future will type into AI, please create this in the style of Rebecca Kamen's sculptural <laughs> art? Do you think they'll do that? And how would you feel if they did? I, I don't know, because I know it wouldn't be mine. I mean, you know, the, the bottom line is, we, we are unique human beings that have all kinds of ideas, thoughts, feelings, and personalities, but you can never be me and I can never be you. I mean, I can have empathy for you. I got excited hearing about your dinghy, you know, and, and the fantasy of, wow, what would that be like, you know, if I had that adventure, but that was your adventure, you know? And the minute you try to recreate my adventure, it's not my adventure anymore. It's your so, adventure. Yeah. A few things I want to share with you before we go, okay? Uh, oh, Number yeah. one, have you read The Dyslexic Advantage by Dr. Brock and Fernet ID? I'm in that book. Oh, you're in the book? Oh, yeah. They're, they're friends of mine. Yeah, yeah. They're okay. wonderful. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm sorry that I didn't rec realize you were in the book. Forgive me. No, they're huge supporters of, of my work. And actually, the, the first trip I took after COVID was to the University of Georgia. And I was the cover girl on the cover of their magazine. And so okay. I, I showed it at the end and, and it was really great, you know. Lovely. Yeah. So there. Well, what, what, what brought it to mind was because. Brock and Fernet were on the podcast a few weeks back oh. and they talk about dynamic reasoning a lot, you know, as one of their four mind strengths, there's mm -hmm. the D stands for dynamic reasoning. And really a lot of what you're talking about throughout this whole podcast has been how dynamic reasoning seems to be a big part of the way that you view the world and view your art so you're both dynamically reasoning physics and science and so on. What are the dynamics of it? And it's not that it's a dynamic that is abstract from reality. It's dynamic reasoning that actually tries to make the reasoning match what reality is, the patterns of reality that lie beneath what we just see, but what's deeper. And you've kind of, in your artwork, are kind of, symbolizing dynamic reasoning. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's fabulous. I'm not a big reader of books. I love looking at books that have images. Occasionally I'll read things, but I will, I will look that up in the book because they sent me a copy. It was really well, sweet. They've done an audio version of the copy as well, and they've read it out. Yeah. So I think it's just been released as well, the audio version. So I'd highly recommend the audio version and just going straight to the dynamic reasoning chapter. And I think you'll find that fascinating about how dynamic reasoning works, because I reckon when I look at your art, I basically see dynamic reasoning in action. Oh, interesting. Rebecca, it has been fantastic to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you. I, I've learned so much myself. And I just really want to encourage people to really never, ever be limited by what other people think and just always just embrace everything that comes your way um, and use it to be able to create new bridges between you and the world around you. Thank you. Bye now. See ya. Bye. This podcast is sponsored by DyslexiaProductivityCoaching.com. It's my day job when I'm not hosting this podcast. Tell me, do you know what you want to achieve in the workplace, but you're struggling with how to achieve it? Maybe you suspect some traits of dyslexia are getting in the way. Well, that's where dyslexia productivity coaching comes in, because we give you a simple productivity system for your Apple devices that harnesses the creativity that comes with your dyslexia. It includes proven methods like note-taking, reminders, speech-to-text, mind-mapping, and more, all tailored to your needs. 
It'll free up your time and help you achieve outstanding results. Book a complimentary call to discuss it with me. And if you do it soon, I may also be available to coach you personally via Zoom. So don't be shy. Go to dyslexiaproductivitycoaching.com or swipe up and book it now.